Okay, welcome back. Uh, we just covered how to fit a linear model and a quadratic model uh, to uh, an example data set that showed a clearly nonlinear trend. We saw that quadratic model did considerably better uh, than the, the cubic, but there wasn't, it wasn't a perfect fit. There were still some, some uh, things to be concerned about, particularly in the, in the pattern of the residual. So we might continue on and see what would happen if we fit higher order polynomials, particularly cubic and quartic. One of the things that we're going to see here is a tendency to ask the question, you know, how many terms in a polynomial do I need to capture a pattern? And that question, how many terms do you need to capture a pattern, is actually uh, one that, that I think uh, underlies kind of one of the reasons that polynomials have been traditionally uh, appealing as a way to capture patterns in data. Uh, and that is because of a, a, an important theorem that you probably learned in your intro calc course uh, called the, the Taylor series expansion. The Taylor series, as a reminder, is the idea that I can approximate any polynomial, uh, any function, any function, not just a polynomial function, but any function can be approximated uh, with a polynomial of you know, n degrees. And when you derive this analytically, you know, it's based, you know, each of those terms, you know, the slope, the term on the quadratic, cubic, quartic, et cetera, are based on the, you know, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, whatever derivative. Um, and, and as you add more terms, you do a better and better job of approximating the model. So, so you can think about polynomials is the same way. You know, as you add terms to the polynomial, even if the model isn't a polynomial, you're going to fundamentally do better at approximating it. And we have you know, calculus-based proofs for, for why that works. So let's dive in. Uh, so adding the, the cubic term is straightforward. It's the same way we added the quadratic term. We want, we use this I function because we want R to interpret that linear, literally. Uh, we add the term, we see our intercept is no longer significant, but our, our X, X squared and X cubed terms are all, uh, all significant. In fact, the higher order terms are even more significant. Uh, and if we look at our R squared, it's up to uh, over 98%. So there's you know, really quite good in terms of the amount of variability that we've explained by the model. Uh, if we can compare that to our quadratic, uh, that was explaining about 93.5%. So, uh, you know, we didn't actually explain a lot in terms of raw percentages, but there wasn't left, much left to explain. We clearly explained over half of what was remaining. But how well did it actually do? So let's look at uh, the line here. Um, and you can see that uh, the general pattern for the quadratic and cubic are the same, uh, but with a couple of important exemptions. So we see at the high end, a, a bit of a higher acceleration up at the end. Probably more important, more striking difference is at the low end, uh, where the direction of the trend is, is systematically different. So the green line with the quadratic thinks that as we go far more negative, uh, that the model is going to turn around and start going positive again, while the cubic is turning down and starting to go negative again. Uh, and it, all in all, that, that balancing between terms is actually making this overall negative response portion fairly flat, unlike the quadratic, which kind of added more curvature to it than there was in the data. Um, and in the middle part, you know, pretty similar bits. Um, important thing to note, to come back to that idea of Taylor series, though, is to remember that one of the disadvantages of a polynomial is that um, it will always go off to positive or negative infinity asymptotically. So uh, that doesn't seem like a big deal on the positive end here, where you know, one of our terms is, you know, they're, they're both going up, just they're going up at slightly different rates, but it's more noticeable on the negative end where what we see visually looks like flat but we have a choice between one function that is eventually going to go off to positive infinity and the other one that's eventually going to go off to negative infinity. So ne neither term is actually, so, so if the response here really was flat, and we don't know yet whether it was, but if the response here really was flat, uh, then uh, you know at some point a polynomial is never a good approximation because you're extrapolating a function that um, is uh, asymptotically going to go to plus or minus infinity. So if, if you have uh, we'll get this get to this later, uh, probably next week or the week after. If you actually want to, if you actually have responses that truly are asymptotic, 
either to zero or to some other value, which happens a lot in environmental sciences, that would actually be an argument for fitting a truly nonlinear model because polynomials only have inherent limits in terms of trying your, their ability to approximate asymptotes. Okay, diving into the, the diagnostics. Um, oops. Uh, we have actually some really good looking diagnostics. So our, our, the pattern of a residual, the trend line is, is basically flat, uh, about as flat as you ex would, could possibly expect given the amount of variable you see in that data and the sample size. You know, you really couldn't expect it not, you couldn't expect it to be perfectly flat. There's always going to be a little bit of wiggle because it, again, there is randomness in the data. And again, the scale location showing that the trend in the, uh, there's no, no real heteroscedasticity, there's no real trend in the variance. The variance appears to be uh, pretty constant. <clears throat> Our normal QQ looks pretty good, maybe a, a little bit of, uh, uh, on the negative end, maybe the tails aren't quite as long as a normal distribution, but not nothing that would be worrisome. And again, we can uh, make a plot of the, the interval estimate, uh, our predictive interval, is, so our predictive interval has gotten tighter, our comps interval has gotten slightly wider. Uh, in particular, you're seeing towards the end here, uh, the negative end, this uh, fact that we're, you know, uh, any prediction beyond negative five uh, is, you know, the uncertainties are starting to rise just in terms of what the line is, but otherwise pretty tight everywhere else. But is this sufficient? You know, it looked really good, but you know, should we stop at three? Or should we keep going to four? So what would happen if we kept going to a fourth order? So again, we've written this formula out in the exact same way as the others. We're just doing I to the fourth. Um, and now we can see um, that the, both the third and fourth have, are no longer significant. So we added a fourth term, and not only is the fourth term not significant, but including the fourth term made our highly significant third term no longer be significant. Um, if we look at these things side by side, um, we can see our R squared went up, but it only went up by like 0 0.0009, so a pretty trivial increase in exp explanatory power uh, relative to the cost we paid uh, in terms of the, the um, reduction uncertainty. So we can also look at our, our residual standard error, uh, and, and that, that did go down too. So, you know, our, our uh, our model is fitting better. Our you know, RSME went from 44.6 to uh, 43.9, so we're doing better. Uh, but it, I guess it remains to be seen whether that, that improvement is really justified given the, the fact that the parameters are, uh, th there's sufficient uncertainty in these estimates that uh, they are no longer uh, significant. And you can actually kind of see that if you look term by term, um, if you look at, say, the intercept, the standard error uh, went from 13.16 to 13.26. Uh, the, the slope standard error went up from about three to about six. Uh, quadratic terms standard error, uh, pretty similar, but the cubic went from 0.1 to 0.3. And then we have this additional quadratic term. So you, you can really see that underlying phenomena that as we add more terms, our residual error is going down, our, our squared is going up, but our parameter errors are also systematically going up. We're having less and less confidence about our parameters. You can also see that's not divided equally. So, you know, the, the linear term doubled, uh, the cubic term tripled, but the quadratic term only went up by, you know, a fraction of a percent or, you know, maybe a couple percent. So not, not divided equally in terms of the amount of information. Uh, and there are other diagnostics look pretty similar. So still no real pattern or residuals, no noticeably diff not huge differences in our QQ plots and no real difference in our, uh, our assessment of, of patterns in the, the um, in, in this, the, the standard error. So no, so pretty constant variance. And from here, we'll, we'll kind of ask, you know, uh, where to go in terms of higher order polynomials and model selection. 